when you are at a point of distress, the best thing we can do is find you an easy way to get some support. Now, that can actually be from a friend who's a good listener and a bit, a bit of a wise ear through to some sort of professional support. But I think we can prevent people moving up the distress spectrum through accessibility. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. So happy to have been given the opportunity to interview Minister Shane Rattenbury on this podcast. He's the Mental Health Minister of the ACT. And we talk about how he manages his own mental health, stigma in mental health in the community, how we can go out and improve accessibility for anyone going out and having difficulties in that mental health world, and also links between the environment and mental health. I'm sure you're gonna really love this one. I certainly did. And make sure if you haven't subscribed yet, do so. It's a great honor for this episode of Better Thinking Podcast to have Shane Rattenbury or Minister Shane Rattenbury who uh, looks after the ACT mental health portfolio. Uh, not only that, but also environment and, and other other portfolios. I'll probably pass it on to Shane in a moment to explain uh, his his various roles. It's great to have uh, Shane here uh, to talk about mental health, particularly, and and I, I believe we might even touch on some of the environmental uh, aspects because I think there's a very much a synergy between the two. Uh, so that, that'll be nice and exciting. And, uh, there's also some, uh, at least one, one question that we've got from a listener or a viewer that I'll put forward towards the end as well. So welcome Shane, really, really appreciate you coming here. Thanks Nish. It's great to join you and I look forward to the conversation. Lovely. Let, let's, let's just get started. Maybe you can tell us, maybe we start with how you got into, um, you know, maybe politics, so, so to speak, and also this portfolio around mental health. What, what, what drives you? What, what, what's got you into this role? I think the big picture answer on getting into politics was I, I describe myself as a child of the 80s. I grew up in a time when there was some really major environmental issues being prosecuted, uh, uh, protecting Antarctica from mining, the issue of whaling in the Southern Oceans, big forest battles in Australia to protect our native forests. These things were going on in my teenage years, which is, I think, a time when a lot of your values and your political uh, views, I suppose, get shaped. And so for me, that was a big thing. And that got me into environmentalism, which has ultimately led me to being involved in green politics. So that's the sort of the big picture of it. The mental health portfolio has come about relatively recently. My background is I just studied economics and law at uni. I then worked for Greenpeace for many years on environmental campaigns. Uh, both here in Australia and overseas. When I got into politics, I came because things like climate change were my passion, mm. wanting to protect the environment and then in the city context, you know, having good public transport, all those environmental kind of questions. But mental health is one of those things that emerged in just in the course of being in politics. And after the last election, I had a conversation with the Chief Minister and we discussed having a dedicated mental health portfolio. The ACT had not had that before and we formed a view this would be a good thing to do. Historically, it sat in the health portfolio. And of course, the health portfolio is enormous. Uh, and there are many pressures there. And I think also having mental health in the health portfolio necessarily puts a clinical perspective on it. And we wanted to build an agenda around mental health that is much broader, recognizing that you know, in people's mental well-being and how we promote that and help it. And it's a, a discussion much broader than the purely clinical bit of the mental health continuum or spectrum, depending on how you describe it. So, and that's the agenda I've brought to the portfolio. So I was pretty honoured to be the first mental health minister. It's It's been a big challenge. It's been a steep learning curve for me because it's not my professional background, but people have been very generous in telling me their stories and sharing their experiences. And it's, it's I think we've started to make some really good progress in the space. Wow. That, that, I, I didn't realise that uh, even being in the industry that this is the first time we've actually had a specific mental health uh, uh, minister and I love I love the idea of taking it out of the health portfolio and giving it its own because um, it puts it on the agenda, it becomes you know, an, an awareness topic, uh, you know, in and of itself 
having a minister specific to mental health yourself uh, changes what mental health is rather than just under the umbrella of all health. Um, wow, I've never never realised that, never recognised it. Came came from such a beautiful initiative. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, we're still very attached to health. And sure, in saying sure. what I said, I no way diminish the clinical role that's there, but that is not everybody's mental health experience. For many people with perhaps less acute conditions with, you know, anxiety and depression, those sort of things which don't necessarily require an inpatient admission, which is where health tends to specialise at that more acute end of the spectrum. There's a whole lot of other things we can do in uh, building people's resilience and giving them coping tools that can help them with their mental wellbeing and that's the space we want to operate in as well. Mm-hmm. It's not ne- not necessarily just the umbrella of the acute mm-hmm. where, you know, in some sense if we look at the spread of the population, the vast majority of us are not in the acute phase. You know, we might fall into the acute phase at some point but we live – you know, more often than not outside of that and, and prevention, well-being, you know, a, a, a promotion of good, healthy lifestyles and mental health is, is is a big part of that portfolio, I suppose, you know, along with the acute. It, it changes that dynamic a bit. Yeah, and one of the things we've specifically created is the Office of Mental Health, which sits a little bit independent from government and – but it's a government agency, but they've got a remit – uh, to operate right across government and in putting the proposal to cabinet, that was a really explicit commitment we saw it, is that the office, the coordinator general of the office has an ability to reach into every government agency and work with them and help them coordinate uh, to identify cross-agency opportunities or cross-agency problems. Uh, and so we've started to really engender that philosophy in government that says mental health is not just the health department's problem. Mm. You know, education obviously has a big part to play in helping kids build their uh, coping skills and resilience and the tools that they need to get through those tough moments in life or knowing who to reach out to, all of those sort of things. So that is, uh, you know, we are building that philosophy slowly but surely. It reinforces and acknowledges that mental health is in all spheres, irrespective, irrespective whether it be education or whether it be defence or you know, uh, environment, uh, you know, before the interview started, you know, we, we touched on that there are some environmental links as, as, as well. Um, and I know that's your, you know, first passion, so, so to speak. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the connections around mental health and, and, and the environment being that, that they're, they're two sort of um, roles that you kind of, you know, hold simultaneously? I think there's a couple of really interesting threads in the in the crossover between mental health and environment. One of the interesting ones is that the natural environment is a, such a a wonderful thing for our mental health. Simply getting out there, being in nature, having those opportunities to, I guess, just treat your soul a little bit mm. with the wonders of nature is fantastic for our mental health. I've heard stories that in some parts of the world. Uh, doctors are now starting to prescribe time in nature as a response to some people's mental wellbeing concerns, you know, and I think this is – I've not found an actual peer-reviewed article on that yet, but I've sort of heard these stories in different places. So that's It, a- it actually has occurred in uh, – from my background, being a Serbian background, um, I don't know this specifically, but I do know stories from my parents having passed it down where people who have been unwell have been told by, you know, doctors, professionals – to basically go up in the hills, usually it involves like going to a monastery or something, mm. but it goes off in you know into nature and you have you know sleeping quarters and duties and so on. But you know it takes those responsibilities away and you spend time you know in nature and after a designated uh, um, period of time, um, they come back and you know more often they're not feeling quite a lot better. Mm. Um, and obviously it's not in an acute phase where someone might be having a psychotic episode or something like that, but certainly someone who's incredibly stressed. Um, well, in actual fact, even a psychotic episode could probably uh, gain lots of benefit from that too. But someone who's highly stressed demands kind of, you know, uh, coming left, right and centre, they're pulling their hair out. To give them that opportunity um, has great merit. And if I think about it, sort of talking about it right now, we kind of do that in our acute uh, inpatient facilities where we say we're going to take you into a hospital setting, 
We're going to take away all of your responsibilities. You don't have to go to work. You don't have to look after your kids. You don't have to worry about, you know, your financial things occurring right now because you're in here and we've got some programs, good people, staff, medication, the like to, to, to assist you. And so you get to your pause for a while. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, now, I don't know that to be to be valid whether it's actually happening or occurring anymore, uh, but uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's a grounding experience. Oh, and the nature thing is very important. I think certainly in the mental wellbeing space in a, in a preventative sense, I speak for myself, you know, I'm a keen runner and here in Canberra we're very lucky. We have some great nature reserves around us. And so for me, four or five times a week, I get out for a run either around Lake Billy Griffin or – I live near Mount Majura and Mount Ainsley, and so I get up there and, you know, I go for a morning run. I'm in the bush. I've got the kangaroos. I've got the birds, a beautiful sunrise, maybe an interesting fog. All of these things are going on. And for me, that's the hour each morning where I get out there and I come back, I feel more peaceful. I often have resolved some issues in my mind. And I think that that's a really important part of that sort of on the sort of low end of the spectrum of just maintaining a good mental headspace uh, I think those things are very valuable. And as you move up the spectrum of need, obviously that changes a bit, but there's still, oh, I think, a really valid place for that. Those connections between, in some sense, you're describing mindfulness. If, if I you know, bring it back to like some psychological terms where you're present, you're mm. kind of connected, you're grounded. When when the birds sing, you hear it. When the kangaroo, you know, pops around the corner or is, you know, under that, that tree, you you observe him, witness him or her um, and appreciate the beauty that's there. When the fog comes, you kind of recognise you know, how far you can see or can't see and, and, and the beauty of the, the spring or autumn, you know, morning. Uh, there, there's a lot of grounding, there's a lot of mindfulness. You know, we, we would often go out and in some sense, you know, quote unquote, uh, 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 prescribe mindfulness, being present and, and it sounds like, uh, the same mechanism uh, that nature naturally does that for you, I'm assuming for others too. I, look, I imagine so and certainly it's that in a, in a modern, hectic world in which there's stressors coming at us all the time, having both the enrichment that comes from the natural world and I think also quiet time. You know, and people might find that funny if you're not into running and some people find running a real battle, you know. Uh, it can be hard work, but you know I've been doing it long enough. I'm fit. For me, it's a it is quite a meditative and peaceful time. But whether it's walking or bike riding or whatever your thing is, I think creating that space and here in Canberra we can do it somewhere beautiful mm. uh, is a pretty uh, pretty powerful thing to do for yourself and for, in a bit of self care and self maintenance. Mm. What do you think about when you're going on your runs? Oh, all sorts of things. Sometimes I'm. I am training. I do train for some races. So sometimes I'm very data and training focused. I've got a heart rate monitor on. I've got that going on. Uh, I've got to think about eating if I'm out on a long run because you've got to maintain the nutrition. But often it's, I don't know, it's just enjoying the scenery. It can be thinking about work issues, but in a pace that where you've got time to distill things and you're not under pressure, you, you can let them filter through. You can be thinking about family. You can be thinking about planning a holiday, whatever it is. Your mind's also able to operate in a space that, where there is space. And again, that's not always a, a luxury that we have. So I find that very valuable. It's sort of a bit of defragging, if you like to put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm interested on, uh, now that we're down this line of thought, what else do you do that you, you feel has worked for you to, to uh, support your own well-being, mental health? Uh, I, I believe you run an incredibly busy schedule in, in, in your role as minister. Um, you know, how, how do you do it? yourself because I I think a lot of us kind of uh, are running around busy ourselves uh, but I think you know someone of, of, of your uh, uh, in, in your role has an incredibly busy schedule yeah it is something you have to be conscious of I think particularly when you do have a stressful life or a stressful job or the pressures of family is to think about how you maintain your own balance for me I have kept doing my sport because that's something I really enjoy and I've got some great friends in that space and so it keeps me connected to that. Uh, but, you know, I could literally work 24 hours a day. There are plenty of things to do in politics. There's always more problems to fix, but obviously you can't do that. And so you have to prioritise and, you know, that comes down to there are things, times when you think, well, I've just got to have today off. I'm actually worn out. 
I feel grumpy. I feel like I'm not quite coping. And sometimes you've just got to take the space. You've got to take the space for family. And I think this applies. You'll take a mental health day? Probably not a whole day that often, but yeah, occasionally. Then afternoon or a yeah, morning? Yeah, sometimes or... I'll just think, you know, I'm not going to work today. I just need a half a day off or something. I've got to even, you know, if you're behind with the life at home, it makes work really hard. And so sometimes, you, go, you know, I've just got to allocate a couple of hours to do stuff. I've got to have time with the family. You know, I think these are rules that everyone should stick to where you've got to find that balance because otherwise the pressure starts to build up in the back of your head and things are gnawing away at you and you become just you become less effective. So trying to find that balance, I think it's easier said than done. I'm not sure I get it right all the time. <laughs> but at least I think you try and think about it and, and give yourself a chance. Otherwise you can start to feel overwhelmed. What what makes you cognizant of that balance for, for, for you? How do you kind of become aware of it? For me, I pick it up either when I get a little bit testy, you know, mm-hmm. and someone who asks you to do something or comes with a question and you find yourself being a bit impatient. Mm-hmm. For me, that's always a signal. Uh, and the You're other, probably the only one, right? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, that's one of those things I'm self-aware of because it's not the person I want to be. And when I hear myself being that person, I've learned that that is the signal that I've, I'm out of whack. And probably the other thing is I think when you struggle to get clarity of thought and you know, all the thoughts are jumbled in there, for me that's another self-aware sign that probably I'm um, – Got too much going. I've just got to slow down and reorganise myself a little bit. Yeah, kind of grasping to 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 make sense of of exactly. what decision to make, or just to even you know assimilate ideas, thoughts in the way that you usually would. And it's kind of like Bing, bit of a bit of a light bulb moment to say I'm, I'm probably carrying too much. Yeah, and I think we've all got those things. And when you perhaps reflect a little bit, you really know what they are, and then it's allowing yourself to. Uh, hear that signal when it comes. Mm. Mm. You know, I'm not saying I've got I've got it perfectly sorted, but I've have learned over the years the things that I know are my pressure points and my I guess uh, warning signs, and you try to work with them as much as you can. Yeah, great, great. What do you think government is is is, is doing um, to support you know people, uh, the community, and being able to you know best. Uh, uh, support and promote their own well-being. What What are some of the initiatives that your government has put forward uh, and and been working on, or even future ones that 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 are up you know up and coming? What are some of the policies that uh, you know approach mental health in that more community wider wider space? Mm. Look, I, there's quite a few things on the plate. One of the things I would make as a general observation is that the mental health space is changing. I think in Australia generally the stigma around having mental health concerns is breaking down. Yeah. It's certainly not perfect. You know, and those who've had that experience will still talk about the stigma in the workplace, in the family environment, in the sports club, whatever it is. And it's well and truly still alive but decaying. It is decaying. And, you know, people who have come forward and told their story have been a really important part of that. The ones who've had the courage to say, actually, I've had this problem, and they'll sometimes go in the media. You know, we've had some famous people who've come out and, talked about some of the battles and I think that's done a lot. Mm. That is predominantly a very positive thing. However, it's also putting some real pressure on government because as people are willing to talk about it and come forward, that's also creating an expectation of support. Rightly so, don't get me wrong. Sure, no, that makes sense. And so that's putting pressure on service delivery response to say, well, what is the right answer? Is there enough service? What are the services that people need? And I think the service system needs to evolve in response to that and it needs to evolve right across the continuum because I think, again, a lot of, as we've touched on a little bit already, a lot of that initial response is at the lower levels of acuity. People who are, you know, lower levels of anxiety or depression, these kind of concerns, and instead of perhaps suffering away in the past or just trying to toughen up and get on with it, people are seeking support now and so, but that doesn't require an inpatient admission. It sure. requires something quite different. And so we need to make sure that the service system can respond to that, uh, that it can people can get access quickly because if you intervene early, most often people get the little bit of support they need and they can their journey goes on and they will make a quick recovery or they'll get the coping tools that they need and they're able to 
sort of make their way. Some people will go more into the service system, require a greater level of support or response. Uh, so that's certainly an area we're having to work on, is to think about what that looks like, how do we make the system easy to navigate. You know, someone who's having a mentally tough time, they're not at their best. They're mm. not most capable of dealing with a complex service system. And so one of our challenges is to make this the system as easy as possible for someone to walk into and say, this is what I'm experiencing. Where can I get the help that I need? That's a good point. I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish in, 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 in a minute. To, uh, but if I think about it, there's, there's a real easy access point for, uh, in, in, in some sense, the more moderate um, or mild or moderate case where someone can go to their GP, get themselves a mental health care plan, and then ref- be referred to a private um, you know, practitioner, a psychologist. And it's fairly seamless. Um, most people are connect, connected with a GP, so we capture probably a, a good good uh, chunk of of, of the uh, community. Then there's something probably a little bit more complex, at least in, in my view. And I haven't haven't um, been able to navigate it particularly well, uh, not myself personally, but observed it through through clients. Is for example the NDIS uh, system, which can be quite complex. And I know that it gets a real you know, uh, knockabout and so on. I think it's an excellent program because I've seen what it does amazingly with, with, with clients. But there is some laborious elements to putting together. Well, there's definitely a, some uh, rough edges on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is that what you mean by trying to make it evolve So, and, and accessibility about how to still try and service particular needs? For example, NDIS would be more of the acute or, or chronic um, uh, experiences, uh, trying to sort of smooth those out? Yeah, I mean, I think the NDIS is, is a almost an entirely different discussion in the sense that… Sure, and I don't want it to obviously overtake no, no, it's, it's a big one. It's, a it, big it's one. such a massive reform and I think the NDIS, a lot of people envisage it being about physical disability or yes. intellectual disability as opposed to an enduring mental health condition. Now, not that there's always clear boundaries between each of those things, but sure. I think that's where most people expect it to operate. And, you know, one of the challenges with the NDIS is that its its very premise is about having a lifelong disability. And, of course, with mental health, people have a – they don't have a linear journey. They have a sure. wiggly journey. You know, they have good patches. They have bad patches. And they recover. They relapse. Um usually not on a regular cycle, all of these kind of things. And so the very definition of the NDIS is challenging for Mm, some people on the mental health spectrum. And so, again, I've heard plenty of stories of the NDIS being amazing for people and there is no doubt it is a powerful thing that has made a significant difference for a lot of people's lives. But as I described before, there are some rough edges on it and we've definitely got some work to do, I think particularly in the mental health space, to uh, make it work better. Mm. One of the one of the challenges as a psychologist, and obviously I'll, I'm, I'm uh, being very specific on on, on that side, is uh, when Medicare support was uh, initially introduced. Uh, I, th- I believe we started. Oh, I, I don't actually know where we started, but uh, certainly when I was introduced with it, there were there were eighteen appointments available for uh, each each person. Um, wanting to uh, see a psychologist. It wasn't 18 prescribed immediately. It was uh, six consults and then potentially another six and in uh, exceptional circumstances, another six, and that was per calendar year. And so that was fairly in line with what what the APS, Australian Psychological Society, sort of has as recommendations. And naturally, um, I say naturally, that's not necessarily fair. Um, Over time, uh, it's reduced um, and I think it went down to 12 sessions and now we're at 10 sessions per, per calendar year. Uh, is this a juggling? I mean, I obviously don't know politics well enough and I know, I know that, that, that there are big buckets and we're trying to balance all the needs uh, and uh, even though this one's reduced, uh, potentially other programs have kind of, you know, come up to, to fulfil some of those needs. How do these things come about? Because the, the, the biggest criticism from psychologists would be, and rightly so, because we're kind of interested in that world, uh, we'd be saying our clients need more sessions. You know, it's gone down from 18 to 10. Uh, can you talk us through about how these sorts of things uh, 
occur? How what what goes out and informs policy, and how would something like that occur? And 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 how does it come back up? And how do we do this? How do we do this? I'm I'm interested because obviously you know you're you're in that world, and uh, I'd love to pick your brain on 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 how that world looks. Yeah, look, I'm not familiar with the specifics of that one because that's obviously sure, sure. Commonwealth level, but. A decision like that, they are, they are tricky decisions. You know, when you sit down and do the budget each year, the thing I can tell you is there's never a shortage of good ideas. <laughs> there are plenty of great proposals that come forward that don't get funded because yeah. people have got lots of ideas. There are lots of needs in the community. And so you're always trying to shoehorn as many things as you can into the budget and resource them as well as you can, but you can't necessarily always I've certainly heard the feedback that you're describing though around the Medicare approach where people are saying you know, 10 visits is not enough. And for some people it isn't. The earlier model you described as sort of the 6 plus 6 plus 6 I think is probably more like it in the sense that each person's journey is different. For some people yes. 6 might be enough, you know, and they'll, 3 might be enough, you know, if they get just the intervention they need and they get it early on and off they go and they're happy and they might come back in three years' time for a top-up, but whereas some people will need a whole lot more. And I think having that kind of flexibility is what you'd want to have. But, you know, I, I imagine the federal government has made these decisions around the need to just constrain the resources. Uh, I imagine, you know, the number of appointments has grew and grew and grew, and at some point they looked at the budget and said, we have to find a way to put a cap on this. Mm. It's making real hard decisions that, that I suppose that – that's what uh, uh, part of the role is, is to make the hard decisions. How many decisions, just out of curiosity, uh, you mentioned there's never a shortage of great, you know, ideas and 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 uh, uh, and, and warranted um, mm. you know, areas to, to, to look at. How many would you say are tabled and, and how many get get uh, uh, utilised, so, so to speak, or, or have to be put across for another day? Oh, look, it's that's a tricky one. If I think about our budget process, you know, without breaching too much cabinet confidence, we probably start <laughs> with, you know, more than 300 budget bids coming at the start of the cycle and probably you can end up affording less than 100 new initiatives, you know, depending yeah. on the size of them, those kind of things. But that's just, that's just that process. Then we've got the sittings of the assembly where uh, backbench members might bring things forward, petitions come in from the public, the opposition brings motions and they write letters to the government about things they want to work on. So there's just – then there's what happens, comes out of the media every day. I mean, you know, we live in a constant discussion of ideas. So there's – that's, I guess, also where I come from where you could literally do it 24 hours a day because there's always more things to think about, which is an exciting and stimulating part of the job, but it also means that at times people feel let down by politics because their idea doesn't make it. And often their idea is a really good one, but it's just in the, you know, in the available hours in the day and the available resources we have, just not everything gets across the line. It's a hard pill to 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 swallow for everyone in in whether it whether it be how we manage the resources in our own domestic households, you know, where there's there's one income or there might be two incomes coming in, and we still need to allocate. Where do those monies go? Where do those funds go? You know, I imagine it's a similar similar thing because there's there's that struggle of you know are we going to go on a holiday this year or not? You know, are we even going to be able to afford one next year? You know, can we put the kids through? Um, you know, to get extra training in tennis next weekend or you know the school term finishes or whatever it might be. And sometimes the answer is no, we can't afford to. And even tougher decisions, you know, do I seek an, another appointment with a psychologist or do I have to spend the money on something else? Yeah. And I think a lot of people, and it comes back to this discussion around Medicare, and so, plenty of people would forego perhaps going and seeking support for themselves to instead fund a new school uniform for the kids or make sure the kids can go on the school excursion, those kind of things. And that's when it gets really tough. Mm. You know, and people do, we know those stories. There are just today, we've seen the report come out from the ACT Council of Social Service, which indicates their analysis shows 26,000 people in the ACT living in poverty. That's an extraordinary number. 26,000? That is their estimate. Yeah. And, you know, I haven't had a chance to look at that detailed report yet, so I can't comment on the specifics of that modelling. But, you know, I think Canberra does have that hidden uh, demographic in our city of people who struggle. 
you know, through unemployment, disability, being on New Start, all of these. That I mean, you know, New Start is is not no one can live on that. And so these are very real choices that some people in our community have to make. And uh, you know, when it comes to then sitting in things like budget cabinet, you sit there going, "Well, do I focus? Where do we focus?" And sometimes the things that would be nice to have have to go by the wayside because there's literally desperate situations out there where you have to try and prioritise those resources. It brings a thought uh, in in terms of the the number of. Uh, uh, Places where poverty can can come from and or, or, or um, feature in, there are some life stages that occur as 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 well, and one of them being older people uh, can be in that in that group where that have their own specific mental health needs and they're often forgotten too. Um, you know the the seniors. You know I I actually like to refer to them as as the wise ones because uh, in in lots of other cultures we. We actually, in some sense, give them the the uh, uh, opportunity to contribute more because of the wisdom, the time on on, on earth that they've spent. There, there, there's a lot of grounding um, that that kind of uh, occurs in that world, um, but sometimes they can be forgotten. You know that they they almost like have a use by date, so 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 to speak. When in actual fact, you know, if we look at our own parents or something, they they don't have a use by date. You know, they they are just as special as they were when when they were looking after us. Yes, oh, I think you're right. There's a there's a sense of a lot of people don't once you become old, you sort of go a little bit on the scrap heap. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think this plays out in many ways. I think in the workforce, we don't value older workers nearly well enough. You know, and I think we need to think about how do we reshape the workforce so that someone who is 65 or 66 but has got enormous experience, they probably don't want to work flat out 60 hours a week anymore. But, hey, why don't we create a two-day-a-week job for them where they can come in, you know, participate in strategic sessions, be a mentor, continue to do some part of a job. You know, I think we've got some work to do to to put – greater value on those things. I'm really pleased. One of the things we've just done in the ACT is actually allow magistrates to become part-time and we've lifted the age they have to retire to 70. It used to be 65. And so now there's someone who's perhaps been on the bench for many years and has got great experience, can stay on a bit longer and perhaps specialise in a certain area or cover a certain – for me, that's a good example. We we need to do much more of it. Um, Interestingly, we've got a team working in ACT Health in the older person's mental health unit. And I went out and visited them oh, a few months ago now, and they were just telling me about the work they've done. And they were talking about how little research there is in the space of older person's mental health. And so they are doing a lot of really interesting and innovative work that they are, I don't want to say making it up as they go, because that sounds very unscientific, but they are literally having to develop new systems and think about new ways to do things because we've got this emerging space that's not very well studied. And I was really impressed by that, that you know, here in the ACT Public Service, some of our staff are just really taking that initiative and inventing new ways to do things to deal with that emerging problem that we have there. It's kind of uh, interesting that, and maybe it's just me, but uh, when, when we start thinking about, you know, older persons, there's almost like this undercurrent of we have to look after them <laughs> as, 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 as though they can't look after themselves mm. and mm. continue to contribute and in actual fact continue to look after us. You know, I, I imagine they've got a hell of a lot to say. Um, but it's almost like this older, older person's idea, and maybe that's just me. I hope I'm, you know, it's not saying it's just enter- being entertained in my head. Um, but in actual fact, you know, it, it, it could be kind of flipped on its head where we, we go to them um, to seek more, you know, consideration because they're in a different stage of life. And therefore, I, I imagine there has to be some greater acuity that comes with that. Maybe. And I just think at a big picture level, older life has changed. If you go back to probably our grandparents' generation, you know, you worked until you were 65 and you probably died by the time you were 70 because that was life expectancy. You had a few years at the end, whereas now life expectancy in Australia for men is what, 85 and for women is 88 or something. Don't quote me on the numbers, but it's that kind of ballpark. You've got a long life after your formal retirement. And so that's, yeah, 20 odd years. You can expect to live for 20 years after your formal retirement age. So what do you do with those 20 years? You know, and that's where, picking up your point, lots of older people can contribute a lot. They can actually, 
you know, and they are often the the real um, foundations of many volunteer organisations when you look around town. And so I think that's what being old is has completely changed as well compared to certainly our grandparents' generation uh, where they did have a very different expectation about it. Absolutely. Move, moving forward and putting some, you know, hypotheticals uh, down, um, well, not even hypotheticals, let, let, let's go to imaginary world. If we could run some ideals, what would you what would you hope to see, whether it be here in, in the ACT or, you know, the, 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 the national sort of perspective, what would you like to see mental health look like uh, in the future? With the Office of Mental Health, one of the things we've just been doing is they've been working out sort of what our vision is for mental health services in the ACT. And we just uh, put it out last week. And for me, one of the really interesting concepts that came through in all of our community consultation from consumers, from carers, people with lived experience, service providers, the whole lot, the word kindness came through. That people who are perhaps have had mental health challenges are looking for more kindness from service providers, from their work colleagues, from their families. And I think that would be a big part of any, I don't want to sound too sort of all airy-fairy about it, but kindness I think is a underrated quality that would make a significant contribution in this space, uh, just as a human trait. From a policy point of view, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. I want mental well-being to be seen as something that is a standard part of government policy. Uh, we've got some really interesting examples at the moment. I've just been chatting to Lifeline. They're now rolling out a program of um, uh, mental um, well-being and readiness for um, particularly their first phase is emergency services workers. So they're doing a big project with the Australian Federal Police where they're doing a lot of preventative mental health work. So they're actually you know, giving people insights into what the warning signs are that you're starting to struggle with your mental health, what some of the tools are you can do, use to respond to that. Uh, so I think being much more in that preventative space will set us all up a lot better. You know, I think about our teenagers that are coming through now and the pressures they're under with social media and you know, we all grow up with peer pressure, but I think it's a whole lot, no, it's a whole lot more relentless now. And so again, having our young people equipped with the skills, and I think we're doing this better, you, know, you go into the into schools now and the stuff they're doing with the kids is a world away from when I went to school. Uh, so I think we're getting there, but a lot of that preventative work, I think, for me is a big part of the future of mental health policy in the ACT and in Australia generally. You mentioned kindness and, and, and then looked at policy. How would kindless, kindness look like in policy? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Sometimes it comes through from people who've had difficult experiences where perhaps the service system, they feel like they've been treated like as a number rather than as a human being. So I think that's where some of that request for kindness comes from. I think in other spaces it comes from when someone is on a difficult mental health space is to for their, you know, their colleagues, maybe to cut them a bit of slack, to be a bit understanding, to acknowledge that someone may not be at their best or – you know, maybe has let the team down a bit, but there's a good reason for it. I think that's what some other people mean by that idea of kindness. Let me put something forward because I've got your ears at the moment, right? Um, how about a world, and I'm just kind of formulating this as we go, um, how about a world where we move away from labels of, of a human experience like depression, anxiety, because I know that we use them quite often to try and describe people's experiences. Uh, and we move into a place where we describe what someone's actually going through. Uh, so it's more of a descriptive model uh, where service providers, consumers, loved ones talk about how someone is going in life. So an example might be rather than going out and saying someone has social anxiety, or social phobia, we might talk about Jimmy who uh, feels like what he says in his social group is not uh, uh, as well 
considered as what another member might go out and, and, and say or they're not funny enough, for example, or at the thought of going out and socialising with their peers, they feel uneasy and have tightness in their chest. Um, and so when someone says, why don't you go out and catch up with your friends, uh, they would rather not have that tightness in their chest. Uh, in a way where we can describe and kind of care for um, uh, and maybe making making policy in in the in light of that, where we assist by talking about mental health in a descriptive model, rather than going out and talking about it in a labelling model. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on on that? I'm not suggesting that that's the way to go, um, or, or, or putting that forward as though. That's Oh, it's a very interesting point, and I think there's some real merit in it. I, I feel like we're – I talked earlier about we're sort of on this journey of breaking down the stigma, and there's an evolution going on. And, you know, if you go back 20 or 30 years ago, in my sort of youth, we didn't have any of these labels. People were – I guess there were different labels. And, you know, they've become more defined probably going forward and – more accurate, maybe? They, they, they used to be, uh, the way psychologists would talk about it in so, so psychiatry, it would be, I've got a 2 p.m. schizophrenic coming in. <laughs> right? Sure, yep. Um, as though the experience was the person, you know. Yeah. So it, it kind of engulfed that, right? And now we say, uh, you know, my 2 p.m. is a person with schizophrenia or experiencing schizophrenia. And so it's evolving. Um, so it's quite interesting how, you know, now when someone hears that, oh, I've got a schizophrenic coming in, it's very, very harsh, right? You know, it's hard to hear. Uh, but that's, you know, once, once what used to be. And that's something I wanted to pick up on in your comments as well is that those labels can be very defining. And I think that we also need to be really clear that even if somebody does have schizophrenia, that is not the whole of who they are. It can be more or less a degree of influences their life, but it's not it's not who they are. It's part of what they cope with and shapes them and that sort of thing. So for me, that's the real worry about the labels. Is and I think people sometimes take those labels on themselves and let it define them in ways that I think is perhaps a bit unhealthy. You know, and I don't mean to be critical of individuals in saying that. But I, I do worry sometimes that people let themselves be put into a box or the label puts them into a box, which is not the, the full picture of who they really are. So, yeah, that's where I think moving away from the labels is, is important. Um, and, but also the other side of it is I think the broader community understanding that if, even if somebody is schizophrenic or suffers from depression or um, has bipolar disorder, again, that's, that's okay. That's who they are, and that might mean you or I, as say their peers at work, need to make a little adjustment for them, need to accept something, or perhaps you know just be thoughtful about how we talk to them or things we describe to them. It doesn't completely define who they are. They're still our colleague, they're still an accountant or a public servant or an or a ambulance worker or you know whatever they are. You know, and that's, I think that's where we need to get to in the evolutionary process is if we sort of take it in our stride and we're perhaps all well educated enough to know how to deal with that. I think a lot of people's poor reactions are based on either ignorance or fear. It's almost like we're at a, I don't know, let, 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 let's say stage three where the first stage was to go out and ignore it and, and pretend it doesn't exist, you know, deny it. And maybe stage two was to go out and somewhat label it and, and, and kind of saying this is what it is, but from a clinical level. And then maybe stage three is in the awareness campaign, which just sounds like we're at at the moment where you know, the government's doing so much uh, work in awareness and, and breaking down that stigma. We're trying to give people language to work with. And so we're just using these, the, the, these labels as a way of uh, making it okay to be experiencing life, you know, and feeling beat you know, be feeling depressed or anxious or you know, worried or whatever it might be. Uh, and maybe you know, the next phase will be to start dropping 
some of those so they don't define us but rather they're you know human stages and experiences um so maybe it's just the virtue of of having to go through the phases oh, i think there's a lot of merit in that and the, i think it's it's healthy at least we're going through those phases we're not stuck we are making progress i don't think we're at the right place yet but we are getting there and you can liken it to all other, all sorts of other examples you know um where we just, you know, we gradually and slowly improve things. Um, you know, geez, only 18 months ago, did we think we'd have marriage equality in Australia? Probably not. But we we got there, you know. And Isn't that incredible? Because we, we just made a decision uh, some time ago saying we don't want to prescribe to that. When I say we, I'm not saying the whole community, but there, there was majority. an undertaking. Yeah, there was an undertaking, certainly a majority, um, uh, to go out and say – it's not okay. As a matter of fact, talking about that, I think it was in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, I think it was in DSM two, um, where homosexuality was featured as a disorder. I mean, isn't that? A- yes, yes. Um, you know, yes. Voted it out as we did with marriage equality, and that's what's quite funny about. Rather than describing it, we label it. If we just described it as, you know, someone choosing who they want to fall in love with and deciding to commit to them for for life. Uh, but we kind of, you know, use some different interpretations. Yeah, indeed. You know, and that decision, for me, that decision was really important for a lot of people's mental health. For, oh, for people in the LGBTIQ community, it broke down a whole lot of sense of discrimination for them. But you're right about how quickly that's changed. I mean, uh, Bob Brown, the founder of the Green Party in Australia and someone who's been a mentor for me, you know, he's an openly gay man and he talks about uh, how here in Canberra in the 60s when he was a doctor, he was given uh, electroshock treatment to try and cure him of his homosexuality. Bob has been through that personally. He's a man who's still alive, who is a known public figure in Australia, and he describes that. And ECT to cure his homosexuality. That is crazy. And that was, I think he talks about that being in the, <laughs> in the 1960s here in Canberra Hospital. He has told that story oh, wow. in, in the media. And so, you know, it shows you, in a sense, how far we've come. But it's also, such a short period. Of time. Yeah, wow. And, but also that was not, yeah, not that long ago. And so that's where I have a lot of optimism about where we are in the mental health journey. I feel we have come a long way. We're not. That's progressed incredibly quickly, considering. But there are still people in Australia who offer gay conversion therapy. That is a real phenomenon in this country, that there are people out there who would position themselves as being a counsellor or a psychologist or something along those lines, some sort of qualified person who will offer gay conversion therapy. That Is is, that ethical? I don't think so. Uh, And certainly... A number of governments around Australia are looking at whether we can uh, make that illegal, but it's a tricky. It's a, one of those tricky ones. It's hard to pin down in legislation how you'd exactly do that. But yes, it's you know I find that very troubling. It effectively goes down and says there's something wrong with you, correct? And and you need to seek treatment for that. Uh, but it certainly places a whole lot of burden and and and, and reinforces a message of self criticism, self judgment. Self-deprecation. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything dis- worse. And discrimination. Yeah. Yep. Wow. You know, and if you go back to the plebiscite last year, I know a lot of people in the uh, in the community found that an incredibly difficult process to have their their rights and the validity of their relationships discussed so openly, and for some people to be really critical of those relationships. I hope that the resounding yes vote in Australia for people who felt that, they felt the yes vote more strongly, that the vast majority of Australians actually support and see their relationships as absolutely legitimate. But I know that some people found that a really hard process. It's a real hard one because I imagine, you know, if if I think about the psychological uh, perspective, if you're told something over and over and over and over and over and over again, particularly as a young person, it reinforces, right? Um, And and large companies know this and so they advertise to younger kids and, 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 and they make sure that, you know, every little kid watching their superstar, 
you know, hero sports athlete on television has got a big, I don't know, Nike symbol or something or other uh, on there because, you know, it resembles something and then we've probably got that that branding there for life, you know. I mean, I, I certainly know, you know, Nike from back in the day and, you know, they're, they're here to stay. Uh, so are some of these ideas, right? Mm. I mean, is, is it that we've got to sometimes wait for the ideas to to uh, go through generations, that it's a generational shift or change rather than something that we can necessarily push along a bit harder that, you know, maybe we're in that age now where some of those views are really solid and then maybe in the sort of, uh, you know, 60s or 70s or 80s, they started to get questions and they built some momentum in those newer generations and that, that there's a more critical mass of people saying, no, 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 wait a second, you know, gay and lesbian and, 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 and you know, the rest of the community are here to stay and they should be respected like every other human being. In, in actual fact, even going out and labelling them as, as gay and lesbian is questionable in and of itself. They're a human being who chooses to, you know, go out and be attracted to whoever they want to be. Attracted. It's not even choice. My apologies. Let me let me rephrase that. And they are attracted to that. I don't go in and say, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a brunette lover," <laughs> right? You know, I don't choose that over a, you know, a, a redhead or a blonde or a whatever it might be, or you know, curly hair or something. Right? It's kind of kind of crazy talk. You know, um, we we just kind of experience life the way that we are. Oh, I think the point you make there is we are all human is the most important thing. It's, mm. And I think a lot of that gets. Lost, and it comes back to your point around labels, whether it's religion, race, nationality, all those kind of things. If, if we left a whole lot of that stuff behind and just remembered that we're all humans, I think government have a lot, lot less problems to have to deal with. We all would. I'd like to ask you a question that, 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 that's come from one of our listeners, if that's, a, if that's okay. Um, I did put a uh, post out in social media and ask if there's any questions that – Uh, we'd like to ask you, so I'll put one forward. Um, And this one comes from Chris Butler uh, who asks uh, what your opinion is on the proposed changes to Medicare, uh, such as the APS proposal of accredited mental health social workers and registered psychologists not being able to uh, see certain clients. Yes, this is not an issue that I'm – really familiar with with the technical details. Sure. But it has come across my desk and I'm, I've been start, trying to do a bit more research on it in recent times. I am concerned by that proposal. Uh, I think that people who are in distress in whatever form it is, there are a range of service responses or professions or um, treatment types that can be effective for them. And I would be reluctant to see particularly recognised qualifications, precluded in some way uh, because I think for some people they will be the right response. So I am concerned by that proposal but I so I, I claim don't claim a great expertise in it at the moment. It's one of those ones that will I know is working its way through the system and certainly as a minister it's not been one I've asked to, been, been asked to have a formal view on yet. Mm. What's interesting that, that I've been picking up on in, in our conversation is so much of what we've spoken about and your responses, at least in my mind, have led back to the word that comes to mind as accessibility. Uh, whether it be the, the the answer to this uh, um, listener's question or how you kind of would like to see uh, mental health uh, services in, in the future, so much as has come back to accessibility. I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that you... Uh, have recognised yourself or that, that, that's front and centre of, of your mind? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? No, it's an interesting point. I hadn't probably thought about it quite like that, but it, it's clear. It goes back to a point I made earlier around when you are at a point of distress, the best thing we can do is find you an easy way to get some support. Now, that can actually be from a friend who's a good listener and a bit, a bit of a wise ear through to some sort of professional support. But I think we can prevent people moving up the distress spectrum through accessibility. Um, It reminds me of one of the big challenges we face in the mental health space, both in Australia and particularly in the ACT, is one of workforce. We are struggling to have enough psychiatrists, particularly, 
and also nurses, particularly mental health nurses in our workforce. Um, interestingly, in the ACT, we the, the national uh, data that's put together by the Productivity Commission shows that we have more psychologists per capita here in the ACT than other jurisdictions, but we have less of psychiatrists. I'm not quite sure what that says about Canberra. You've probably got a better insight than me, but I think the bottom line is we don't have enough overall. And people say it can be very hard to get an appointment. If, even if you've got the money, it can be very hard to get a to get in sometimes. And certainly mm. many of the, the psychiatrists in the ACT have closed their books. Uh, and one of the other things we know is that our, our workforce is ageing. I think 20% of the psychiatrists in the ACT are over 65. Wow. Wow. We've just put that in a submission we've made to the Productivity Commission. They're doing a review of mental health services in Australia and that's saying we've identified through our own data. You know, that raises real questions. We need to get more people trained in this space and I am not. I don't mean particularly psychiatrists. There's a whole spectrum of people who work across sure. the provision of mental health services but it's an area that does need a workforce for the future. So, you know, one of the things I try to encourage people is if this is an area of interest to you, it's a great area to get involved in. You can make a real difference in people's lives. We, As government, we need to think about how we're going to encourage more people into the space. Do we need to make sure the unis are offering more places? Do we need to um, offer scholarships? Do we need to think about what the training pathway is, how the job opportunities play out? We can't just increase salaries all the time because, you know, there are limits on these things. So, and I, I think for a in the mental health space, it's not about money for a lot of people. It's a calling more than it's a way to make a buck. And so, you know, we've got to think very carefully, how do we make this a more attractive place for people to go and work? Because workforce is a massive issue. We can't just ship people in from overseas. Again, I think there's ethical issues around that. We shouldn't strip these people out of developing countries necessarily because those countries need those services as well. I mean, it's a it's a medical workforce issue generally and it's particularly acute in the mental health space. I never thought about that stripping the, 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 the brains trust from another developing you know country. Never thought of it in 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 that way. The ethical sort of consideration that, that obviously comes from your greens background as well. I'm I'm, I'm assuming that, that that that's the way that you think. That it's a broader picture rather than oh we need it. Bring those resources here. You know oh we need it. Just pay them more. You know it doesn't work that way. Oh, I think it's a tricky ethical and moral question. I mean. At one level, if someone's from a developing country has worked hard and got themselves to uni and got qualified and they want to come to Australia, who are we to deny them that opportunity? Yet at the same time, their home country undoubtedly needs those skills and qualifications. And so, you know, I don't think there's a black and white answer to this, but we we as a developed rich country cannot just assume we can we can strip those resources out. Wow, I've never thought of it in that way where we're taking resources and in some sense stripping it from other countries. I mean, my my parents came as skilled migrants um, and, you know, they are, you know, workhorses. They, they went out and uh, like a lot of uh, migrants who are probably uh, uh, over – over are represented in in the, the sheer volume of hours that they put in, you know, because they came to Australia for the the, the better life, yes, as, as many as many do, and 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 they certainly did get that. But at the same time, those workhorses would have been really useful um, in, in in their uh, former home country, uh, which lost out. Mm. You know, they 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 kind of um, you know gave them up, so 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 to speak. Obviously, for the fortune of of. Of my family, uh, but certainly the misfortune. When I think about it now, I've never thought of it. Kind of like the, that commodity was taken away. We, mm. we we mined the people and sent them overseas. <laughs> Pretty much, and you know, obviously to Australia's great benefit. This is a country built on migrants, and I would never deny people the opportunity to want to come to Australia as well. I've gone overseas and worked. You know, it's a terrific thing to do, whether it's in the short term or for a permanent migration. These are, you know, we want people to have that opportunity, but. You know, there is a downside to it as well that I think we need to have some at least awareness of as we think about where's our workforce coming from. Almost looks at that once again, that that nice synergy or cross point between the environment and 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 and, and mental health. That that's what I think is so so beautiful in in uh, hearing your views to to see how it crosses over because it gives a very, very, very different flavor to what you're able to 
offer and bring forward to you know mental health in in in, in the ACT Canberra and uh, you know hopefully other other states can go out and recognise uh, your great work. Yeah, thanks very much. One of the things that's starting to happen now is some of the other jurisdictions also have mental health ministers. And so this year, I'm trying to organise for all the mental health ministers from the various jurisdictions to get together so that we can start to share some of our experiences and, you know, build up a a national response to some of these things, things like workforce. It's not saying we, the ACT alone, can fix. We need to work with the other jurisdictions as well. So again, for me, that's part of that evolution in the mental health space. There's more and more dedicated mental health ministers and therefore, you know, uh, focused thought going to some of these hard questions and that, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, wow, wow. The 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 evolution is really exciting. Uh, Minister, it's been an absolute pleasure to to have you here on on the show, and and I think your your views are exciting and and really uh, for 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 me uh, inspiring because I, I I see a much brighter mental health future uh, coming about. Obviously, having you know. Uh, direct representatives like like yourself, not only here in the ACC, but as, as you mentioned now, in other jurisdictions. And I, I hope that we can get that collection of ministers together talking about very specific mental health needs and how we can do that potentially on that national level or or individually because there's individual uh, uh, community needs in each of the jurisdictions. So how can people get in contact with you if they want to, you know, uh, you know, make contact and whether have, they have some questions or want to go out and bring something to, to your attention that you might be able to bring, uh, put forward from in your capacity. Sure, please do get in touch. I am easy to find. I'm on all the social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. And then, of course, my email address and my phone number, just literally just uh, use your favourite search engine to find me. Uh, I've got plenty of available info on the web there. Fantastic. So just Google you and, and it'll much. all come up. It'll yeah, all come up. In yeah. any in any social media. Funnily enough, there is another Shane Rattenbury in New South Wales who works <laughs> in New South Wales Corrective Services. And I'm also the Corrective Services Minister here in the ACT. <laughs> I've been in his workplace, but he wasn't there. But I think his workmates found it quite funny. But yeah, pretty much I'm easy to find. Look, I have the same problem with my surname, Nikolic. Uh, there's a couple of Nikolic's around and, and some of them make me more nervous than, than <laughs> others. There's, a, I think, a well-known Nikolic surgeon and, and I'm always happy to be sort of uh, in connection with, with him. I've never met him. I don't know who he is, but I'm certainly happy to be in his company. We've got a Nikolic who I think is quite high in the military ranks and once again, I'm quite happy to be uh, uh, associated there. And then we've got a famous Nikolic jockey, um, <laughs> who's been probably on the wrong side of the law a few times, or yeah, at least um, at least questioned around around some of that. So I don't know how much of it's valid or not. I won't go there, but uh, I certainly don't have any affiliations. <laughs> <there>. <laughs> at least not that you're admitting to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister, for for coming on, and uh, look forward to being able to you know share the mic with you another time. Thanks very much for the invite. It's been a great chat. Thank you.